One of the things with brain mapping, you can read the volume or the amplitude of the brain. And what we see with the ketogenic diet is that the volume uh, uh, goes up. Same as we use any sort of mitochondrial support, so Conzyme Q10 and PQQ being uh, another uh, factor I use quite a bit, but you can actually see the volume of the brain picking up. So instead of just a whisper, you can actually get a better signal, which wow. is pretty cool. Patients with um, high-risk dementia seem to do extremely well with a ketogenic diet. In my practice, uh, the ketogenic diet is, is key, uh, specifically with the uh, uh, adjunction of uh, medium-chain triglyceride oil, coconut oil, mm -hmm. and uh, seem to do well quite a bit. Uh, they do find it quite hard sometimes, especially in the beginning, but I find if the spouse is on board, much, much easier. And they like the fact that they lose a bit of weight around their middle. Hey folks, it's Mike Mutzel here with HighIntensityHealth.com. Thanks for tuning back in. We're live with my friend, Dr. Jan Venter, and we're gonna talk about cognition and brain health and ways that you can improve your cognitive function throughout life, right? Through, you know, Because I guess, Jan, a great launching point, a lot of people are concerned about their brain health or cognition. Okay. Um, there are subtle ways, subtle things in our diet, excess blood glucose and insulin resistance, and you know, without your brain, what do you really have in this world? And you have a unique way of assessing cognition and then improving that through natural remedies. So I guess a great launching place would be kind of talking about how you got into this. Yeah, so when I first came to Canada, I uh, worked in a very small place called Chilliwack, which is about an hour east from here. Mm -hmm. And it's on uh, Highway 1, which is like I-5 in, uh, in the States, and a lot of car accidents. And um, what I soon realized is that patients, when they had traumatic brain injury uh, or concussion, there was really no way to turn to and no ways to really uh, evaluate what was going on. Uh, at that stage, they were giving basically prescription meds, usually was a mixture of two antidepressants, and it's like, okay, well, see you in six months, hopefully you get better. Mm. And for me, that was just not good enough. And uh, specifically in a, uh, a country as advanced as Canada, I, I started to say, well, dig a deeper, there must be something more. And uh, a buddy of mine from South Africa introduced me to neurofeedback. And he was using it uh, for um, evaluating fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. And it intrigued me because here's a way to peek inside the skull without um, invasive, uh, invasive procedure. procedures like sure. radiation or doing an MRI. Which if you already had a concussion, the last thing you want to lie in the cool, cold tunnel for half an hour right. uh, with a woodpecker going on around your head. Mm. Uh, so EG uh, really intrigued me. Uh, the uh, equipment really got cheaper. It used to be about 100,000 bucks in the late 1990s. Got nice and small, and uh, I was able to, to uh, uh, become part of the ISNR, which is the International Society for Neurofeedback and Research, and got through the process, started doing EEG, and it's a way to capture brain data, um, but make it live, so you can use the data to compare it to a database and either to yourself or um, to a, a standard database from about six months to 89 mm. and started using it for um, uh, evaluating brain, brain health, uh, specifically cognition, and see if there's any problems with depression, if there's any problems with concussion, ADD, uh, and the list goes on and on. And we add in new modalities almost every year now. Wow. So what started out is, is really, you know, providing people that didn't have a tool, you know, back right. then, like a car accident where they really, like you said, they were given an antidepressant to now in your practice where you're seeing executives and, you know, CEOs and so forth that really want that competitive edge and want to preserve right. their brain function. And so for someone that is not really familiar with neurofeedback or the quantitative EEG, it's looking at electricity within the brain, right? right. And then how can you ascertain whether it's hippocampus or prefrontal cortex or different regions of the brain that are not functioning. I mean, if you were to like describe this to a new patient, what, how would you articulate that? So there was uh, an amazing breakthrough in, uh, in uh, specifically in uh, neurophysiology uh, quite a few years ago in Switzerland at the Key Institute where they were able to use um, GPS data uh, technology to peek deeper, take the data that you collect from the skull, and we usually use 19 sensors, some companies use 128 sensors to get more high definition. You can then calculate the location of where the uh, aberrant brain signal is coming from. 
and then we compare that to the Broadman areas uh, mm. specifically. So you look at your Iber campus, you look at say Broadman area 28 or 24, and then we uh, try and match the symptoms to where the uh, location of the problem is. Wow. And then you can do the reverse with neuro feedback where you only get feedback if you're able to enhance the signal towards a positive. If you don't enhance, you stay quiet, there's whisper quiet, the brain doesn't like it. The brain likes action, the brain wants to, uh, to, to move and wants to grow. And uh, when you feed it with noise, you feed it with video, for autistic kids we use um, vibratory cushions, you can use pulse light, you can use electromagnetic energy with PEMF, and then you gently coach the brain towards a path of neuroplasticity. Mm. Typically it takes about six to seven sessions, about 30 minutes each, and then you start seeing the learning. Uh, basically it works on operant conditioning. Interesting, okay, so I've, I've used neurofeedback before. For some reason in my mind, and I just, I'm glad you clarified that, EEG and neurofeedback are totally different things. So EEG is the uh, technology to read signals. Mm. Yeah, neurofeedback is, the, is basically giving the brain direct feedback onto uh, and what we call instant feedback mm -hmm. as to what exactly is normal. We use a standard deviation as an analog, sort of like a bell curve. So normal would be between a standard deviation of one and minus one. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be at minus two or minus three. So we gently coach the brain and say, okay, well, try and be normal. Now, for my executives, they mm -hmm. don't want to be normal. Ah. They, of course, they want to be like... Outliers, yeah the outliers or they want to be like their former self. So part of my executive health program, and I call it Brain Vault, is where when executives sign up, I do a quantified EEG. We do usually do about a 10 minute strip mm -hmm. uh, of EEG, um, get that logged into the database. And then when anything ever happens to them in the future, we can always go back to that baseline. Uh, the famous story where uh, a very well-known businessman in Vancouver uh, signed up, did a brain map on him, and within a month he was on his way to uh, to the airport, got into a motor vehicle accident, and uh, sure enough was able to do his brain map, showed a significant concussion, and was able then to treat him uh, back to his normal. Wow. And that was, that was just fascinating. So the, the proof is really there. Mm -hmm. So you're getting kind of your blueprint so that you know if there's any pathology like disease, like you mentioned, dementia or Alzheimer's, exactly. or a traumatic head injury that you can get back to your baseline. Exactly. I like that. Now, uh, we're gonna get into all the details. I would love to pick your brain, exactly what you did a little bit there, but I just wanna, wanna pause and, and see uh, what folks have at home. Uh, I know you recommended the Muse app, I think. Correct. To me, and I found that to be pretty uh, helpful. I don't necessarily love the Bluetooth, uh, you know, and stuff like that. Um, but I know that there's, uh, you know, in office, you know, what you were talking about, that neurofeedback, like you're watching TV, or uh, for me, it was a movie, the movie 24, um, with Keith, Keith Kiefer Kiefer Sutherland. Sutherland. Yeah, and, and so that's really, like, you have to pay attention. There's a lot of moving scenes and parts, and the movie would, like, blink when I wasn't in that zone, and so that really helped me. It was through another practitioner that's been on the podcast, Fred Grover, but um, what do people have at home to do some neurofeedback? You know, there's the, the Muse, other tools that you recommend? So there's a new uh, company, a uh, friend of mine, Leslie Sherlin, started a company called Versus, and he worked with uh, Red Bull and a couple of their professional athletes and designed a dry cap EEG, which evaluates the front, the back, and the sides of your head. It's about five sensors, whereas the Muse is really good for the front of your, uh, front of your brain, your frontal lobes. Mm -hmm. So it's good for meditation and calm, but really for high performance athletes, for somebody at home, you want something that's a little bit more global. Mm. Uh, so the Versus uh, is available, uh, I believe it's about $400, $500 US. Uh, does work with Bluetooth, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but Again, 20 minutes a day, uh, it's probably better than having a cell phone close to your temporal lobes. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, uh, Open EEG project is uh, where they do 3D printing at home and you can make your own dry headset. Oh, wow. uh, there's an Open EEG uh, project um, that's available as well. So these things are coming down in price. Mm -hmm. What's your realistic concern about the Bluetooth because I've used the Muse, I don't know, probably like 180 days straight, and then I kind of stopped and did learn how to meditate, you know, through uh, insight meditation, right? But what's the concern there? I mean, what do you think? I mean, being yeah, I think and, and it, the the worst concern is we really don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's uh, we have all these EMF technologies, and 
if you look at the disclaimers that some of the cell phone companies have, they do say you have to hold it further than, was it six millimeters when I looked last time? Mm -hmm. And most people I know, I mean, you're having the phone right there. Yeah. So uh, the muse being right around your temporal lobes, I think that might be a concern if you're going to use it 24 hour seven. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the fact that you're using it for a specific purpose to get you to a different place, I think that's okay. Uh, same as the verse is about 20 minutes a day. Uh, okay. Bluetooth 4, I think is the, or Bluetooth 4.1.1 is the newest technology, so it's much lower um, uh, amplitude, and uh, hopefully there'll be less uh, EMF. Uh, oh. I certainly don't want people to have their Bluetooth receiver all the time by the hippocampus. I certainly that's a concern, but I think long long term we'll we'll learn just as bad as we learned about smoking and BPA and. Mm. It's going to probably say, oh, shoot, I shouldn't have done this much. Right. Yeah, what was I thinking? Exactly. Yeah, driving with no seatbelts. I mean, there's a million things <laughs> yeah, exactly. that we look in hindsight, like, what were we doing? Exactly. Uh, okay, let's go back a little bit, shift gears back to that executive that was in the car wreck. So we have the blueprint and, and you know, of their brain, right? So we can get them back to baseline. Um, wh at what age would you recommend people get the blueprint via the quantitative EEG and kind of so I've been a big proponent actually starting with kids. So I've got three daughters, so I've actually got them already imaged. Now, of course, growing brains, so I have to keep on re-imaging them every year. Sure. But I would think probably 10 to 12 is a good start. Mm -hmm. um, for executives, about 35 to 40. Um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Dale Bredesen, called it a cognoscope. Oh, wow. He says you should have a cognoscope at 45, and I thought that's just a brilliant idea. Totally. Now, there's different ways of doing a cognoscope, of course, but uh, I thought that was just a brilliant term, and you can give them all the credit. Yeah. Because uh, once you've heard that term, you'll never unhear it. Right, right. Um, so I think 35, 40, probably for an executive or anybody who's going to do any sort of contact sport. Um, mm -hmm. And some days a contact sport could be tripping over a toy in your, in your uh, bathroom. I mean, sometimes silly things like that can happen. Which is really scary. Yeah, I mean, like you said, a, a car ride going to the airport or uh, slipping on ice. We were just with another practitioner, Dr. Sarah Kinnan, and she was work, talking with a patient who was uh, traveling to Boston and slipped and had a TBI, you know, traumatic brain injury. So it's really scary stuff. And it really underscores the importance of your work and what you're doing and, and the work that you're promoting is get your brain scanned so you know where your baseline is. Exactly. You know? So I think I'll give people a little bit more assurance, you know, that if you're trending to back to where you used to be, you can have a little bit more confidence in your abilities. Exactly. Um, so Jan, let's take a deep dive a little bit into what you did for, let's just use this patient as an example. Yeah, so uh, one thing that the brain map showed is exactly where the concussion was, because that's always tricky to find it, because the MRI doesn't always show the, uh, the micro uh, hemorrhages that you might, might see it months later if the, the ferritin uh, deposit shows up on the MRI, but, but really uh, at that stage you could see the electrical changes, sort of almost what I would call a vacuum on the brain. And I was able then to use um, uh, uh, low intensity laser mm. to stimulate that part of the brain first, so inc increase cerebral blood flow. Mm -hmm. And then I used this Loretta uh, neurofeedback process, which is low uh, resolution electrical tomography, uh, which then pinpoints almost like a, a laser precision. I believe it's currently about seven millimeter resolution in the brain, hmm. which is pretty awesome. We, yeah. I, I know we're gonna go better, but at seven millimeter resolution wasn't too bad. Sure. And then train his brain towards his normal. So really the optimal neurofeedback. And took about four or five sessions and uh, he's recovered. He's um, gone up to, to even higher standards to himself and uh, I check in with him every couple of months but he's doing awesome and we, we really just did those four or five sessions. Wow. On a functional matrix model of course had to work on his sleep, had to work on his exercise, mm -hmm. work on his hormones, uh, DHA was quite low, testosterone mm -hmm. was low, help him into more regenerative capacity, um, help him with uh, structural, so I, I worked with a friend of mine who does a lot of um, cranial sacral work, mm. helped him with that. He had to do some vision therapy as well. So really a holistic approach to, to get it better. Right, it just wasn't one pill? No. no. <laughs> so let's go back to the lasers. These are lasers that a lot of chiropractic physicians and osteopaths use. So this is, uh, this is a laser that was developed by NASA uh, uh, to help with wound healing. That's about 30 diodes. Wow. Uh, it goes about two inches into the 
tissue, mm -hmm. and it's called a photonic stimulator, and uh, it's, uh, it gets very hot, so it actually has a fan. People think it's a hair dryer, uh -huh. um, but I find it very, very helpful, and there's been a lot of interest in light therapy, but specifically focus light therapy, so you know what part of the brain to stimulate. Sure. So that's the importance, again, of getting this map, so you know which regions It's exactly are where you can where you can go, exactly. Yeah. And these lasers um, developed by NASA, are these things that are available to most practitioners? If they are um, there is some training, minimum training acquired. So yeah. usually people that have been going through the eyes and R training with neurofeedback, wow. usually they say, okay, you, you're allowed. So you have to, there's, a, there's a bit of a certification process because sure. there's a safety issue. Yeah, that sounds amazing, Jan. That's, that's really good stuff. I want to get into all the functional medicine stuff that you mentioned, but let's finish off on the PONS device. So you're in charge of this amazing research study between, I think, you know, the Canadian and U.S. governments, Health Canada, the FDA, for this way to, to induce plasticity. It's really exciting. So let's talk about that a little bit. So when I first came to Canada, um, I watched this wonderful program uh, by David Suzuki called The Nature of Things, and he interviewed Norman Deutsch, who's the father, or I should say he's the author of neuroplasticity. He really is the first guy to write about it. And he made um, Dr. Michael Mersenick's uh, uh, work famous. Um, Dr. My Michael Mersenick runs Brain HQ, which is the online uh, brain stimulation software. And they seem to be getting closer and closer to FDA approval, mm. getting really good results there. But Norman Deutsch, in his first sort of chapter, talked about this amazing device that's helping blind people see. Hmm by stimulating the tongue uh, using electrodes uh, developed by Dr. Paul Bachirita from the University of Wisconsin. And uh, the video that they clearly showed, very blocky at that stage, uh, I think it was like 2002, 2003, sure. uh, showed this gentleman who was um, blind at that stage uh, using electrode with coupled to a cam camera and he was able to, in very pixelated vision, able to orientate it along a path, he was able to catch a basketball, yeah. through it through the hoop, repeatedly, wow. have some kind of semblance of vision with this uh, stimulation device. Now, the device was about this big as a backpack, it was on his back, if I remember correctly, and mm -hmm. I just thought, well, this is the coolest thing. So you stimulate a new pathway, so instead of from your retina to your occipital lobes, mm -hmm. it goes through your tongue, to your occipital lobes, so just finding a new uh, detour. Mm -hmm. And very, very quickly, without stimulants, without talking about exercise, or so the lazy man's way of stimulating neuroplasticity. Now that was 14 years ago, and I always wanted to say, well, how can we use this device in clinical practice? You may or may not know, it takes about, what, 30 to 50 years to get something from clinic uh, from research bench into bets, uh, to bedside. Mm -hmm. And uh, so lo and behold, this is 29 years later uh, from the original Bajirita device, and it's now available for clinical research. Uh, I'm the principal investigator in, Ca in, uh, in, in Western Canada for the PONS, is now version four. Mm -hmm. It's now as nice and small as a collar around your neck. Wow. The electrode is nice and small, there's about 300 electrodes on there that uh, you rest gently on your tongue and you can sit gently and read, and this will stimulate, it feels like pop rocks on your tongue, hmm. and it stimulates two cranial nerves from your tongue right into the uh, brainstem, specifically the PONS, which actually stands for the Portable Neurostimulation Device, and stimulates neuroplasticity. Wow. What we're currently looking to see is, does it help in patients with concussions, TBI, specifically with dizziness and um, balance problems. Mm. So we're doing a, a physical uh, therapy program using um, balance therapist and then using the PONS at the same time. And of course, there's a randomization with a, uh, uh, the PONS signal not quite being the, the accurate signal. So we can't wait to see the studies. We hope, we're, with the study results, we hope to have it ready by uh, next year. Mm -hmm. and, uh, or early next year so that we can have this device FDA in Health Canada clear so that it will put the device in every practitioner's hands. Yeah. You have to be certified to use it so it won't be something that's commercially available, but it'll be clinically available. And there's ongoing studies for migraines, um, Parkinson's, um, MS, multiple sclerosis. Uh, Montel Williams actually is a major shareholder. He mm. himself has um, MS. He's one of the spokespersons for the company. Wow. He's 
backing the uh, study, I believe, as well. And um, so sky's the limit, so the lazy man's way of neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. And then you add in the functional medicine and the supplements and nootropics and the sleep and the exercise, and we can really uh, make, a, make it a game changer. Make a huge shift in your brain. Wow, exactly. that sounds really exciting. So we'll know uh, at the end of 2017, or? I believe the, uh, currently, uh. Uh, it's pretty easy to manufacture a device, we just need to get approval. Oh, that's and we really need exciting. this research study, so yeah. Yeah. Okay, I want to get into all the functional stuff, so we're not going to keep listening, folks, but what about flow? This is a huge aspect that you speak on. You spoke at the last Institute for Functional Medicine in an international conference about flow and being in that state of, and if I remember correctly, it, it was uh, high risk, meaning like, so if you're on a bike and you're doing something really high risk, but you're letting things kind of go and you're in the zone, how does flow enhance everything that we're talking about here with neurogenesis and plasticity? Are they correlated? So the thing that got me into, into flow is um, uh, Stephen Kotler who wrote The Rise of Superman, mm. uh, specifically had Lyme disease and uh, he was basically depressed and suicidal. He wasn't able to write anymore. He's a, a, a very uh, famous um, uh, journalist, uh, wrote a few books, and he just couldn't, everything he was presenting, the, his editor said, no, yeah. this is, can't, can't publish this. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, was taken by his buddies to go and surf. He's like, well, this is crazy. Yeah. But long or short of it, he got into this amazing uh, state where he felt his brain working again. And uh, he, being a very uh, scientific writer, he's like, well, I need to go and figure out what this is. And he mm -hmm. discovered uh, uh, that this process actually is called flow. And this is the optimum state of mind where you feel your best and you perform your best. After about a year, we kept on going out surfing and surfing, and this was out just out of LA, his Lyme disease started getting better and better. Wow. Now, being a functional medicine specialist, seeing how difficult it is to get people through Lyme disease and it's hyperbarics and neurofeedback and this herb and that herb. What works? Do you have to do chelation? Uh, that was just fascinating and really reverberate me. So I need mm -hmm. to study this and figure out more. Yeah. Um, and in a state of flow, um, you, your, your brain releases this amazing cocktail of dopamine and anandamide and serotonin and um, and that seems to be uh, healing for some people. Hmm. For, so I'm not a high risk taker. I like to uh, run very fast. I like to do the occasional bungee jumping, but I'm not going to be one doing parachuting and uh, do crazy falls out of airplanes, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. How can we, and, and neither would my, my average patient, specifically not my Lyme disease patient. Sure. Surfing in Canada doesn't quite work yet, except for Tofino. Yeah. So how can we apply that? And uh, there is a way of uh, releasing flow. Uh, there's, uh, there's about 17 triggers uh, that's available. A lot of them are social triggers. Mm. Uh, public speaking being actually a, a trigger because uh, there's very low risk. You're not going to hurt yourself. Right. Risk is to your self-esteem. Um, then uh, doing uh, things that just got high environmental content, so very novel. So like Disneyland is a great place to, 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 to develop flow in, hmm. uh, but you can create that in your, in your environment. So uh, in your work environment, Apple, Google, uh, that's exactly what they do, I believe, uh, 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 Adobe as well. They develop their work environment so that you can stimulate your uh, personnel to be in flow all the time. Wow. And makes the creative juices flow. Mm -hmm. So through novel environments, they're creating that? Or? Novel environments, yeah. uh, making sure that you get enough rest. Uh, so mm -hmm. the, the typical flow cycle starts with a struggle where you have to, uh, you, you have to do something you haven't done before. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Jamie Wheel and Stephen Cotter uh, figured out it looks like about a 4% challenge. So it needs to be 4% harder than you've done before. Mm -hmm. It needs to be a little bit harder. Not a lot, just 4%. And then there's this release, and at the release you get um, a release of uh, nitric oxide. Then you go into the flow cycle, and the flow cycle could be seconds, or it can last minutes. For some people it can be hours, some people it can be days. Nobody can be in a flow state all the time. And then very importantly, to close a loop you have to be uh, in the recovery period, which is really sleep and rest. Mm. 
and most of us, that's where we suck. We don't, mm -hmm. we keep on pushing ourselves. We drink coffee, we drink high energy drinks to keep going and um, we don't recover enough. So we don't get back into that flow cycle. Mm. And uh, one of the biggest things to get into flow is to sleep eight hours. Wow. And then you can complete your loop. So one of the things I brought back into functional medicine is to help people to get their uh, recovery period and I use HeartMath, I use the Inner Balance mm -hmm. app, uh, works really well, people always have that with themselves and then, uh, and then constantly get people to sleep better whether it's with nutraceuticals, uh, using biofeedback tapes, meditation tapes, doing yoga, getting them when they're resting, they're really resting. And then the struggle phase, you said you need to do that 4%. Mm -hmm. Recovery, the nitric oxide, uh, best way, of course, there's lots of super supplements, mm -hmm. but just red beet, uh, red beet juice you can get from most of the um, whole, whole food choices, that kind of uh, distributors, or you can just make it yourself at home. And then, uh, and then finding a novel environment, something that, um, that you have to use your body for a little bit. So, uh, uh, Jamie Wheel and Stephen Coulter designed this pretty cool flow dojo that they uh, they got a bolt in um, in several areas in the states hmm. where you can do um, almost like a gyroscope. You go in 360 degrees. Uh, they've got this 360 degree swing that you go up and down, low risk because mm -hmm. uh, you're strapped in. Um, they've got a skateboard that you can go different ways. Wow. And they have a bit of a traveling dojo at this stage, but there's going to be one hopefully in every major center. They're hoping to uh, have biofeedback and neurofeedback all connected uh, so you can in real time see, okay, am I in flow now? Mm -hmm. What I need to tweak? Just a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. right. And, uh, and then enhance. That's for the common person, not the, uh, the, the, the high performance athlete. Yeah. So what do you do personally to get into flow? For me, best is, is running. I've always mm. find that running is easy. I live right across the uh, endowment lands in Pacific mm. Spirit Park. Very easy. And when I did some research, they showed that uh, some trees released uh, specifically um, uh, certain polyphenols that stimulates uh, BDNF. Wow. So you don't get just the oxygen, and the, uh, but you also get the BDNF with exercise. So I find running for me is probably the easiest way. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, Jan, that's really amazing. What comes to mind, I don't want to make it a personal thing, but skiing for me, uh, yeah. and I used to race motorcycles, and, and I could tell, like, if I'm riding with people that are faster than me, and then all of a sudden you get faster, you can get in the zone, and then same with skiing, if you go moguls or do cliffs or whatever it is, backcountry, it's a little scary at first, you're not really sure, and that it's that 4% that you're really challenging yourself, causing that plasticity, but the only winter that I didn't ski in my life due to a back injury was like the most depressing winter I've experienced. And so when you were talking, I was thinking about, wow, that, that makes a lot of sense, you know, so get out there and ski, do novel things like you're saying, that's really, really fascinating. And what about travel? What about just new environments? I know. Yeah, so traveling is great. Mm -hmm. uh, the specific environment you haven't been to or don't know much about, uh, great, uh, especially if you connect. There's a social component to flow as well, uh, what they call a helper's high. So just sometimes traveling and helping out and, and, and uh, connecting uh, with people will uh, release uh, oxytocin, hmm. which seems to be, that's part of the rest recovery cycle. So the more oxytocin you can uh, release, um, the better your recovery and then the better you can struggle, the better you can complete that loop. Wow. So like, for example, what comes to mind is like Haiti, right? When there was the big uh, exactly. the earthquake, right? That, that caused, yeah, so a lot of folks. So doing things like that, it's not just good to make you feel good, but neurologically, there are some real physiologic changes going on biochemically in the exactly. brain. What we did uh, at one of the flow uh, camps uh, last year in Austin, we did, uh, we had a martial arts uh, dojo and that, got us all into flow and it was a group flow. Mm. So it was great. So you get the personal flow and then you got the group uh, dojo type idea and it was quite amazing. And it was a very elegant instructor at that stage. Mm -hmm. Got very, very quickly into flow. So um, that's one way. I'm not a great skier. So anytime I go ski, I get into flow very quick. Uh, <laughs> Being from South Africa, I just yeah. uh, don't get to whistle quite as much as I would like to. Sure. So that, that brings up an interesting point because sometimes in yoga, when there's a big class and people are pretty advanced, it's easy to get really in the groove. So that could be 
kind of that group cohesiveness, energy of the group can facilitate the flow in, in, in the individuals within that group is what That's you're saying. That's right, yeah. And what I use in my practice is music. Uh, so music specifically, sort of a rhythmic beat, a great way to get into, uh, into flow. Um, a lot of people go, when they go to, uh, to a, a rock concert or music concert, they get the same, same kind of idea. Right. Yeah. Interesting. I'm thinking group meditation too. I know they have a lot of those in New York and San Diego and LA, so that's pretty interesting. Exactly. And then one thing I'm still, we're all still experimenting at the Flow Genome Group is how can you use neurofeedback to stimulate the, what we found is that the correlation of struggle is beta and high beta, so your brain is very fast trying to figure things out. Mm -hmm. Release is alpha, so that's your meditative state. And then uh, uh, the uh, flow state is a theta gamma coherence, as we call it. So your, your brain is really firing at theta and uh, gamma at the same time. So it's slow. Uh, theta waves is uh, usually about four to eight hertz, so four to eight waves per second. And gamma is usually very fast. So you get to sort of very fast and slow uh, at the same time. Your prefrontal cortex shuts down, so you don't have that Woody Allen telling you, you can't do this, this is dangerous, don't do it, you're gonna kill yourself. Mm -hmm. So it shuts it down. That's what the theta and the gamma waves do. And then as soon as you release, of course, then you get uh, delta wave sleep. And you can easily do that with uh, neurofeedback. You can um, stimulate the beta, struggle a bit more, maybe sitting watching a computer game, currently playing with virtual reality because mm -hmm. you can really trick the brain and feeling it's right there. Um, and then stimulating the, the, uh, the, uh, the flow cycle from that. So very, very in the process. We are hoping by 2020 to open source this for everybody. Wow. So that everybody in the world can have access if you want to, to hacking flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Jan, I was thinking about virtual reality, VR, when you were kind of talking about that because you can simulate those scenarios like you're saying. Let's kind of finish off a little bit with the, with the fun stuff, the nitty gritty, the functional medicine matrix and kind of how you and I met back in 2008. The, uh, I think it was one of the first advanced practice modules in LA. It was exactly. I was GI, I believe. Yeah. And that's so where I met Helen, I think. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. That was like the, uh, the old crew. I mean, we always, we went to all of them. I think we're the first the, the first attendees on a lot of these things, right, and yes. cut our teeth with some of those. Did you did you do the exam yet? Not yet. Yeah, I'm going to do it in January, I believe. Yeah, yeah. the exam is going to be twice as hard next year. Ah, uh, you're yeah. going to yeah. grade me, right? <laughs> Give me a secret word. <laughs> yeah. So, so you mentioned, uh, again, going back to the executive, how we kind of launched this, who was on the, his way to the airport, I believe, got in a motor vehicle accident, and you didn't just do the EEG and the neurofeedback. What you did was you mentioned sleep for that neurological pruning. You mentioned androgens, DHEA, testosterone, mitochondrial function. So let's kind of tease apart some of those things. I find it particularly interesting that you mentioned low androgens, and we're now finding androgen receptors and other hormonal receptors in the brain. So intrigue us a little bit with the hormonal regulation of cognition. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen has really got into with the reversal of cognitive decline and finding that estrogen force carries glucose into the brain. And that's something that's for us quite new, even on functional medicine, it's a very new concept. Sure. Uh, progesterone, we always knew there was progesterone receptors in the brain, plays a role. Unfortunately, the research haven't quite panned out, at least the regular research. Um, so, but uh, pregnenolone, uh, DHA, uh, something I discovered a few years ago um, that uh, it's not just your adrenal glands that makes DHA and pregnenolone, but your brain makes it too. Wow. So there are ways to, of course, whether you do it topically, supplement it orally, um, measuring it, of course, first to see where's your, where's your threshold. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in enhancing that, uh, this specific individual uh, was definitely in the andropro state. Uh, having met him before, so I know, I knew he's based on hormones as well, so I could tweak that. Mm -hmm. It was very stressful because there was um, some business dealings going on that he couldn't go to. Uh, so he was able to help him with his with adrenal support there. But biggest thing there was just the fact that you can give him that safety net, so don't worry, we know what your brain's supposed to be like on, mm -hmm. a, on a normality level. Getting his sleep back uh, to, uh, to normal. I uh, find B12, specific hydroxycobalamin B12 uh, injections, very, very helpful hmm. as an antioxidant uh, peroxynitrate scavenger. I find it very, very helpful. And of course, enhances energy, mitochondrial function. Mm -hmm. um, magnesium, 
uh, unbelievable help, specifically the magnesium freonate now mm -hmm. that he discovered, uh, especially in the hippocampus, there's low levels in dementia, mm -hmm. um, and uh, glutathione. Uh, I think at that stage we gave him some glutathione IVs uh, a couple of times a week. I usually find it works about two days, and then some oral supplementation in between. So. Hmm. You mentioned offline uh, curcumin and resveratrol. I know you're a fan of those Correct. phytonutrients. Yeah, I uh, particularly like the product by Zymogen, the Mito kit, because it's mm -hmm. nice and easy to sachet once, twice a day, yeah. uh, one packet twice a day, which is great, so people don't pick around too much. Right. And I particularly like the curcuplex uh, twice a day, which is available in Canada, which is awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah, that BCM95 delivery system is really It's fantastic, pretty cool. yeah. Um, yeah, so, th so the IV glutathione, now you mentioned peroxynitrate, some of these free radicals. So are, th are these specific to brain inflammation, you know, like you kind of talked about? Or? No, the, the cool thing is because, yeah. of course, in a, in a car accident, it's not just your brain that gets injured, it's all your soft tissue mm. um, damage, so you get inflammation. So it really helps for the, for the whole bodies. And that's the cool thing about doing brain health, because it's really holistic health, you help right. everything. Uh, fish oils, of course, omega-3 uh, fatty acids, mm -hmm. wonderful. Uh, one trick I learned from the neurofeedback side is the American uh, military use high doses of EFA and up to 20 grams that they give you in a ready packet before you go into battle. Wow. And you're supposed to then start supplementing uh, sort of in the, in the war zone so that in case you hit an IED, that you'll be protected. And it seems to be, at least the research they presented, seem to be quite uh, favorable towards using the high doses. And of course, then you step up after uh, being diagnosed with a TBI. Hmm. Uh, one of the things I first learned about um, uh, the military use of EEG is they developed, where my machines are, some of them are portable, but hmm. they developed a backpack version that can withstand um, uh, sand, rain, can do a brain map in the back of Apache helicopter, right, for the SoCo. Wow. Of course, it's a million dollars, yeah. but military grade. Uh, but they use uh, high doses of fish oil with the, uh, as soon as they diagnose a concussion. Hmm. And what I'm finding fascinating is they've been doing uh, probiotic research or microbiome research, trying to select what's the best way to, uh, to make more brain cells, just like David Palmutter says in his book, Brain Maker. Wow, that's amazing. And that was quite prescient because they, talked about this about 10 years ago. Right, that, that, oh my goodness, that's really fascinating. So going back to the fish oil, the 20 grams, Dr. Retzler actually, she was a past podcast guest, said the brain is sort of the consistency of tofu. And you know, all these, I think called uh, the ventricles and such, are poke out these protuberances in the skull. And so when the brain gets rattled, that's where we get the TBI and the traumatic brain injury. But the, the fish oil are we helping the cell membranes there. So if Correct. there is a sudden shift in velocity that it's more protected. Exactly, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and it helps with, as we say, we there's, there's certain phases, of course, in a concussion, mm -hmm. the inflammatory phase and then the, the post-inflammatory phase. So it depends where you hit, but essential fatty, uh, fatty acid seems to hit every single, hits the inflammatory, it helps the neurogenesis, mm -hmm. uh, it helps um, uh, soft tissue recovery. So you're really hitting every single goal. Wow. A little bit has emerged about the ketogenic diet and the role for increasing brain drive neurotrophic factor, reducing the free radicals that you mentioned. Clinically, have you experimented with that and what were the other folks recommending in the, the neurofeedback community? So specifically uh, in, my, in my practice, uh, the ketogenic diet is, is key, uh, specifically with the uh, uh, adjunction of uh, medium chain triglyceride oil or coconut oil mm -hmm. and uh, seems to help quite a bit. Uh, they do find it quite hard sometimes, especially in the beginning, but I find if the spouse is on board, much, much easier. Yeah. And they like the fact that they lose a bit of weight around their middle. Yeah, right, but do you see some shifts I see some great benefits, yeah. And uh, one of the things with, neuro with, with brain mapping, you can read the volume or the amplitude of the brain. And what we see with the ketogenic diet is that the volume uh, uh, goes up. Same as we use any sort of mitochondrial support, so Coenzyme Q10 and PQQ being uh, another uh, factor I use quite a bit, but you can actually see the volume of the brain picking up. So instead of just a whisper, you can actually get a better signal, which wow. is pretty cool. Now, is that specific to any brain regions, or this is in general? This is in general. 
So you eat fat, thing. your brain gets bigger. Who would have right. thought? That is amazing. That's really pretty fascinating. Now, eat the right fat. You right. Yeah, this isn't just lard and Crisco. Yes. Uh, but speaking of, of dietary shifts, what about, I mean, we hear about, you know, like Dr. Perlmer has talked about this a long time, when you be, have an insulin resistant brain, it actually shrinks. So that's kind of an interesting, you know, polar opposite kind of theory, right? Exactly. So what we're starting to see now more in, uh, especially in brain health, is uh, to look at your APOE um, re receptor or your um, uh, genetics, because certainly the patients with APOE4 uh, double alleles are definitely much more at risk, and you have to play a little bit um, safer with their uh, uh, fatty acids and that, so very, very close touch there. But mm -hmm. patients with um, high-risk dementia seem to do extremely well with a ketogenic diet. Hmm. That's very interesting, Jan. Uh, what sort of dietary plan do you personally prescribe? Or, I know you eat a lot of vegetables. We've had many lunch meetings over the last couple of years. but So I tell people if they can to try and be as mostly vegetarian as they can, the so-called flexitarian mm -hmm. uh, lifestyle. In functional medicine, we talk about the paleo or the pesky Mediterranean diet. So it seems to be something that resonates with most people. Right. Uh, I like to uh, tell people it, try and be as much vegetarian or vegan as you can, and then we can monitor and uh, uh, go off, of course, uh, usually try people on a complete elimination diet for at least 21 days, mm -hmm. specifically if they show high inflammation or high IgA, uh, and then I get people to test and say, use yourself as a, as a, as a experiment, N of one. Yeah. And if you do great off it, there's really no reason to put it in except for making the, uh, yeah, baker's happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, I mean, if it's going to be a small treat once a month or on a birthday or whatever, but not a habitual thing. Exactly. But, Jan, I really like how you look at all the pieces of the puzzle, the functional medicine matrix, the hormones, the nitty-gritty neurofeedback work and getting down and looking at plasticity there, flow. We've covered so many different, you know, topics and, you know, different aspects. You know, I think people are looking at little small pieces, but they're not connecting all the dots. And I think that's why you're such a busy practitioner and executives come see you. You know, if I was Canadian, I would come see you. I tried to, but they wouldn't allow me, <laughs> right? But let's kind of finish off with nootropics. This is an area that, that's pretty hot right now. People are looking at uh, uh, alpha GPC. There's other compounds out there. Uh, you know, how effective are these things? Should we cover all the basics and then look at them? What are your thoughts? I think uh, as a substrate, so like GPC being, uh, being part of the, the, uh, the essential substrate of the, uh, the nerve endings, your axons, your myelin sheath, I think no problems there. Uh, we're concerned about ramping up or revving up a brain that's already starved of energy. Uh, sort of a similar habit would be where you can hack your sleep, where you only sleep four hours a day. That's awesome. Most people after six months, I mean, they're just literally ready to kill someone. Mm. It's cool to brag about it and say, oh, I can do it. But, you know, at face it, you, you just don't operate as well. And if you look at people with uh, EEG and evoke potentials, they, their brains are just not firing as much. And you can rev up your brain as much with uh, caffeine or uh, energy drinks or whatever nootropic there is. You have to be careful you don't over uh, uh, amplify your brain. Mm -hmm. and so there's, I think there's definitely a safety net. Uh, we use paroxetam uh, IV in South Africa as a, as a way for um, uh, after alcohol withdrawal seen it work really, really well. We use it for neuropathy. Uh, it's not even available in Canada. Wow. So, and this was something that I, my uh, professor at family medicine was doing. It wasn't even something that was frowned upon. Hmm. It was just uh, regulated. Same as uh, glutamine. So uh, glutamine was a very powerful uh, uh, product that I learned not from functional medicine, but by my surgeon buddy. Wow. And, and uh, when he was a, a fellow in, in surgery in ICU, they used glutamine yeah. after major surgery or after major trauma, as I call it. And that always stuck with me. Yeah. And it's not something that I ever saw being used in, in, in regular medicine. Hmm. Is it reparative not just for the GI tract, but are we talking about neurotransmission? So for neurotransmission mm -hmm. uh, as well, and of course the, the gut-brain connection. So it just makes sense that glutamine in uh, approximate uh, circumstances, we always worry about the uh, glutamine glutamate conversion in some people. So it's something you just have to monitor and measure. Yeah, interesting. So what I inferred from that is the real work, it comes back down to sleep. You need that sleep to repair 
some of these adaptive changes that you're trying to cause to be permanent so you can have a, a lift in your cognition potentially, right? And uh, throwing all these nootropics at, into the mix may, may or may not. Yeah, I think the, yeah. the best thing is, is to measure and see, okay, what does your brain do? Uh, mm. the, the beauty of EEG and evoke potentials is that you can uh, see where you're at at that stage and then you can experiment a bit and see, as long as it's safe, see, okay, are you moving the needle this way? Am I stuck? Am I going backwards? Mm -hmm. And and then trust the data because I think a lot of people is like, oh, I feel brain fog. It's probably just because I've got a bit of a cold and not seeing that there's a deterioration. Right. Uh, and and what I see, what people have, they all these, these stacks. They've got six or seven stacks. It's like, how do you know which one is safe and which is not? So you can measure. And I think some people are being safe, but I think there's a there's a way to just monitor, make sure that all your organs are safe, not just. Your, your ego. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really important. I like how you're, like, objective feedback exactly. and, and tracking it and be science-based about it, not just uh, kind of emotional and, well, there's some good research on this supplement, so I'm gonna take this and then, yeah, yeah I really like that, Jan. Um, so we have a few final questions here. We wanna get to know you, Jan, a little bit better on a personal level. We know that successful people like yourself, you're running this amazing study with the Pons Group, you have this busy practice uh, working with executives. Uh, we know that the morning time is kind of sacred. Do you have a morning routine or something that you do in the morning that makes uh, your lifestyle a little bit different than others? So I perform best if I, when I wake up, uh, go for a run, get my 30, 40 minutes. I'd like to do interval training, so like nice sprints. Mm -hmm. uh, I come back and I do have my one vice in life is coffee, mm -hmm. but I have an, a, a, a nice little espresso uh, before and then I find that that uh, works best for me. If I can do some inner balance or some heart math, that sets me up for the day and just sort of plan the day. Um, on most days, it doesn't quite work out. Yeah. Uh, busy, busy guy with three, three kids. Three kids. Three yeah. kids, dog, mm. two cats, and a guinea pig. Wow. And they all demand time, and they yeah. all speak to me, and they all talk to me. So, so on certain days when I can do that, that's, it's an awesome day. Mm. Uh, I have a stack of vitamins I take. My wife laughs at me, but yeah. it works on the days I, um, that I miss, I can really feel it. Yeah. Um, I take a, uh, usually a mixture of, if you live in Canada, you have to take vitamin D, mm -hmm. and I put all my patients on at least 5,000 units, and then I measure, I, I test, see yeah. if, you, if you don't have genetics, we don't know if you've got a VDR polymorphism. 5,000 probably you could start, but otherwise I measure if people don't get better. Mm -hmm. And I put all my patients on a probiotic of sorts, and I like, um, uh, whole fermented food, so of course if they can they can uh, handle that. Always, I put all my patients in probiotics, so try to do what I give to my patients. Sure. And uh, I love to take B B12 and um, uh, and then what whatever I measure low, I usually tell people that the most important thing your body needs is the nutrient that you that you're missing. So mm. figure that out. And right. sometimes the best way is to do. Uh, a bit of a history and a bit of an exam and some lab test. Mm -hmm. I love that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about exercise and other research on increasing brain drive neurotrophic factor and what's good for the brain. Tends to be weighted a little bit more towards uh, endurance training, if I'm not mistaken, but I know resistance training has a lot of benefits too. Jan, if you could pick one or the other. I know you personally like running, but from a data standpoint and you know, as a practitioner, what do you see really is great for the brain. So I think if we go back to a mechanistic level, anything that helps the mitochondria um, uh, uh, divide and uh, cause fission, and it looks like sprint training uh, really, uh, or interval training seems to be the best uh, way to do that. Um, I think endurance training is important because of course you need more muscle. I think that's helpful, but if you don't have, you have 20 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have the time for the endurance. I think the, the sprint training is awesome. And uh, we see that in, uh, in, in clinical practice as well. I see a lot of patients with early cognitive decline and when I get them to do the sprint training, I see the best benefit very, very quickly. Wow. And that's my clinical experience. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting about high intensity interval training, but what about sauna? I've noticed similar subjective feedback with you know, uh, post-exercise and post-sauna therapy. Uh, I know there's a lot of European-based research that it's good for uh, body recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally recommend infrared sauna or far infrared sauna more for detoxification. Um, testimonials tell me a lot of people feel great when I do uh, the far infrared sauna, so I think there's probably something there. Um, 
I haven't seen any studies specific in either of actually search for studies on BDNF. Mm -hmm. uh, there's precious few because everybody's chasing a drug to do BDNF, uh, right. so there's not a lot of money in that, but certainly it'll make sense uh, on, a, on a mitochondrial level. Uh, I know there's a lot of work being done on um, cold baths and then um, contrast. Uh, and, and, uh, contrast baths, so I think there is something there. Uh, seem to stimulate the mitochondria. The mitochondria seem to thrive when it's stressed a bit, oh. and then it divides. So, so maybe there's something there with sauna. Mm -hmm. I have found that, um, that high heat and or infrared sauna really enhances uh, the ability to focus and cognition afterwards. Similar, right. I would relate it, uh, again, this is subjective, similar to like post-sprint uh, training. You know, that ability to narrow in and focus and that neurological noise tends to be muted a little bit. I think what we're probably looking there is to increase uh, cerebral blood flow, which mm. of course then will stimulate neuroplasticity because you need oxygen, you need blood, you need yeah. the nutrients there. So there's probably something there. Interesting. You said nutrients in that last uh, segment right there. So one question we like to ask every guest is if you, there was one herb nutrient or botanical, just one that you could not live without, vitamin D and omega-3s are covered. Jan, what would that be and why? Uh, specific for me, it will be B12. I mm -hmm. think one day if I die, it will be Dr. B12. Uh, I've always liked B12, uh, whether it's hydroxycobalamin or uh, methylcobalamin or adenosylcobalamin. Mm -hmm. Seems to be um, something I grew up in South Africa. I, my GP um, believed in it. It seemed to have carried over, and functional medicine just opened the doors of why it works. Mm -hmm. It's not just because you're low in B12, it, it has all these other amazing properties. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I can't do without my B12. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, roles that B12 plays in the brain and the central nervous system. Is exactly. That right? uh, yeah. uh, in my former career, I did a lot of fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome, and certainly, at this, if somebody um, was keen to try it, probably had the best trajectory in, in improvement of health wow. with, with, with the B12. It's pretty profound. Yeah. So, Jan, if you were to uh, bump shoulders with a politician, uh, anyone from the U.S., South Africa, Canada, what sort of health tip would come to mind that they could maybe influence policy around? That's a good one. Mm -hmm. um, depends who I bump into. Yeah. Uh, currently, uh, the project I'm working mostly is, is reversing cognitive decline. Um, so what I specifically would like to do is more focus on getting people to sleep better, eight hours, uh, maybe some way to avoid accidents. I think uh, people texting, you probably saw today, mm -hmm. driving around in Vancouver, people are currently texting because you get that dopamine hit every time you get a, a like or a, or a, or a text. Yeah. And uh, I think political world to say, hey, we need this. The technology is there, I believe. Most of the major cell phone companies do have the patents and the technology to do that. We just need the political oath to do that. Because, uh, frankly, I can do all my nootropics and I can talk about neurofeedback, mm -hmm. but it's better to protect a brain from getting hurt in the first place. And one of the biggest things now, of course, is, is um, a distracted driving and distracted walking. Mm -hmm. Toronto, I believe, under correction, but I believe they're about to implement some kind of a penalty if you walk across uh, a pedestrian crosswalk and you're texting. Wow. It's supposed to put your phone down, and there'll be a, uh, quite a significant penalty for that. So, yeah. so that's probably something I think that's something that's realistic that can be done now. Mm -hmm. I think uh, bigger, bigger vision would be to do the uh, reversible cognitive decline, um, getting uh, uh, focusing on, on sleep. I think eight hours sleep is really what we need. Uh, you can be basically sleepless in Seattle <laughs> yeah. all the time. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, if ma every major city, especially Vancouver, I've noticed if you live in the downtown area, there's so much natural light, it's really hard to sleep, it's noisy. So, exactly. yeah, a lot, a lot of research is coming out on that. Uh, well, Jan, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your amazing wisdom. If folks want to learn more about your work, or if you're a Canadian citizen and, and, they, and they want to see you as a patient or, uh, you know, follow you, online sources to connect with you. I know you're on LinkedIn, you're on Facebook, where should they reach out to you? Probably easiest to go to falscreekhealthcare.com and to start from there with your phone call away and they'll direct you to the right person. Fantastic. Jan, really appreciate talking with you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks so much.